Don't they say, you know, you make plans and God laughs because I would have never imagined I would have done this. But I love it. And I love, and and now it's the goal of just telling people about it. And, and that part is not easy, but if there's anything I like to do is kind of overcome a challenge. And, and it, if it's hard, hard means it's doable. Join me, Dr. Rachel Beanland, public health doctor, meditation teacher, and physician coach. Hear stories of women in medicine who created unique paths and ways to live more mindfully. Throughout my career, I experienced the challenge of finding the right path and the desire to be authentic. Transitioning from clinical medicine, I struggled to find role models, and I turned inward to explore how mindfulness could guide me. My hope is to provide an inspiring light to doctors who want to free their inner selves, cultivate calm and balance, do medicine differently, and make a bigger impact in the world. Okay, welcome everyone to the Authentic Tea Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Beanland, and today I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Laura Gabayan. She is a world-renowned, highly published physician researcher who scientifically defined wisdom in her book, Common Wisdom. For this book, she interviewed 60 wise individuals of ages between 50 and 79 years across North America and arrived at the eight elements of wisdom. Her book is fascinating, insightful, and concise. And I'm really, really looking forward to delving deeper into the reason behind this book and lots more that Laura is going to share with us today. So welcome, Laura. Well, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. I would love to know what inspired you to write your book, Common Wisdom, The Eight Scientific Elements of a Meaningful Life. So it's interesting because before COVID, my health kind of took a nose dive and I went back, I, I saw all the physicians and I really felt like medicine, as you would know, kind of is limited to viewing things in a box. They don't have that bigger lens. And, and then I'm like, well, who does? And that's where I thought the wise do. And then I looked into wisdom and I'm like, well, this is a topic that's been talked about in history in all the major religions forever, and yet no one really knows what it is. And so I was like, well, okay. And then I'm like, so I want to do the science behind it. And, and, and so I was like, I don't know anything about wisdom, but I know how to develop a science project. So I evaluated a science project, and I interviewed people and I came up with elements. Now, the reason we stuck to the ages that we did was because to do any project, you have to look at what's been done before. So I looked at the geriatric, psychology, and sociology journals. And that's when I found that wisdom has an inverse view relationship with age. And, and that the fifth, people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s are the ones that are considered at their peak of wisdom. And that's why we interviewed them. Fantastic. Wow, that's fascinating, isn't it? To think that there's that, that peak. And then after that peak, if you're actually starting to lose some of that wisdom. I think it's because they, they're they just not, they're more set in their ways. And I think people are, are not as ready to take on other ideas. They're not flexible. So that's why we, you know, we stuck to that age range because of that. Wisdom also... It has no, no no association with gender, race, or political affiliation. It does have an association with a region. So that's why I stuck to North America, but like Asia, for example, or the Middle East. It has a specific region, but that's but, but I spoke English and I thought that worked best. Well, what's amazing, which we touched on a little bit there, is that you've used all of your expertise to approach this project in a very evidence-based way. You know, you've used that expertise to really make sure that it was a robust research project, which gives such a lot of weight to the findings. Thank you. And, you know, someone asked me, they're like, well, how did you come up with the 60? I'm like, I'm the researcher. You never, never, that would be biased. I never chose not even one of them. Because that would be biased. And so yeah. I just said to everyone, do you know someone who is wise? And that was it. Yeah. What a great question. 
I think we should all ask ourselves that and, and think about who we think, oh, you know, who would we identify as those people in our lives who are wise? Because that, it's that in that itself easy. is a good question. It's not that common and it's not that easy. I mean, it's funny because when I was writing my book, my I had two people, one editor, one publisher, both say, well, you know, the results are so robust, wouldn't they apply that if you had 6,000 wise people? I'm like, you'll never have a 6,000 wise people. It's like, well, maybe 600? I'm like, well, maybe. But even that would be hard to find. Based on, I mean, these were people all over the globe. I mean, not globe, in the U.S., but the East Coast, West. It just, they were everywhere. And so it wasn't that easy. And they weren't friends. They were... They were like, so one person was like, I went to college with this person. Or one person was like, I know this person, he's a colleague. Or it just random, it was just not that easy to find these people. I can imagine. And tell me about how easy it was to analyze. So obviously there are eight key themes that have come through. And as I shared with you, when I'm reading them, you know, it really resonates with me, all these themes. So how easy was it to analyze all of the data you collected and find those themes? So there, with research, as you would know, there's two ways to approach it. What I was used to publishing was quantitative research, looking at the numbers. And then you have qualitative research. And qualitative is really just starting off from not knowing anything. Qualitative is taking a story and changing it into data. And that's what I did. So when you do that, you start with different ideas and themes and what do these stories have. And so initially when I looked at the the people, when we looked, it was a group of three of us, when we looked at the interviews, there were t- over 20 different ideas and they collapsed into eight. So for example, like under positivity, gratitude is under positivity or humor is under positivity because you know, we found a lot of people who were very funny. So it was, it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And were there any themes that surprised you as they came through? Like you say, some of them obviously collapsed into others, which may have been something that you wouldn't have seen originally. But was there something that came up that you thought, oh, I'm really surprised that that was a common theme? I think it's funny because if you look at my 10 questions, I did ask people what was very important to them in finding friends. And the second element was kindness. So I think that one was very surprising to me because I'm Middle Eastern and being kind is not something that my parents talked about or it's not something my culture. I mean, in my culture, it was more of if you're kind, then you're a pushover and you're not smart and you're not... And it was the opposite of what I thought and, and of, of being kind. But, you know, and, and when you think about it, a person who is kind is so confident and is so secure that they don't need to be loud and mean and all those things. They're kind because they are secure in who they are. So kindness was the theme that was the most surprising. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm really intrigued that also it was something that you hadn't identified in yourself, like you say, from your own cultural upbringing and and thinking that that was something you resonated with. So how do you think the findings have changed your approach to wisdom? Has, have you implemented certain actions more than others? Has it changed certain aspects of your life? I think I've just been more cognizant. Uh, for example, my husband is very kind and, and I've noticed, you know, the kids really resonate and relate to that. And so I've just noticed more of the way he acts or, or just being positive. I, I push more of that. I mean, I am a positive person, but just, I push more of that when it comes to kids or just my life. I think of everything is the positivity or Creativity, I know it's it's hard to be creative sometimes, but it's something we're all born with born with, right? Think of little kids. And and so when I think about that, I'm like, okay, how can I make things more or be more creative for my life? So it's kind of made me more aware of everything and how important they are. 
Now, when I think about the eight elements, I'm like, you know, someone emailed me and he said, I'm very intelligent, but I'm not wise. I'm like, no, no, no. the goal is not for you to say, I'm, I'm not wise. No, the goal is for you to say, okay, I'm not this, but I can make it more. So if someone, for example, is not spiritual, I think they can try to increase their spirituality. So, or, or humility, I think. Humility was very, I, I, I love that chapter. I, I really feel like, you know, you don't need to be your own PR person, right? And, and being humble goes a long way. Oh, one of the things I mentioned to you, which I really love, is that every chapter has exercises. So it gives you three little questions that you can reflect on and to really think about how that theme reflects in your own life. So what you've just described there of taking one of those themes and thinking, you know, how does that reflect? Maybe it doesn't, you know, like there are aspects that some of us probably think is that lacking. So it's a really nice way to be able to have a book that's interactive as well. And then think of it as a companion, like it'll, it'll change. I mean, in 10 years, and I was not a special person as medicine, as you would know, when in medicine is not believed upon at all. I mean, we are just, it's not something that we think about a bigger thing in our life. It's not considered. And so, so I was not one back then, but now I am more. So I think it's going to change with years. Yeah, it's going to change over time, definitely. And so could you share a little bit about how you found the experience of writing a book? Because as you shared with me, that is very different than writing an academic paper. And so many yeah. of us are quite used to that, you know, writing a manuscript or writing a presentation, but actually writing a book, it might be something that a lot of people think about or sort of, you know, dream about doing. But what did you find were the main differences for you? And what were the challenges that came up from that experience? Well, for me, I don't know if this applies to anyone, but for me, the challenge was making it readable, making it relatable. And it's funny because when I first showed it to my editor, he was like, this could be a pamphlet. It was so short, you know, and it was very to the point. And that's just how I am. I'm very to the point. And I, for me, for most people, you know, you take a lot of, and you cut it down. For me, it was so tiny and I made it more. And for me also, I feel like every time I'd publish a paper, I would say, oh, it's like writing a book. No, no, no. writing a book is very hard. And, and it, it, so the hours that went into it. So this is why I totally believe that, you know, things happen for you and they don't happen to you. And that was in my resilience chapter is because I wrote the book at, at the peak of, I have chronic Lyme disease and at the, and Lyme can alter your sleep. And so the peak of when my sleep was altered, I would wake up random times in the middle of the night, like one or two in the morning and I would write. And then I'd fall back asleep, but that's when I would write. And that's when I was like, okay, so the Lyme, as hard as it is, let me write this book. So, uh, so for me, I think the challenge was making it more longer. And also, you know, that was really the main. And then now the challenge is marketing. It. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And marketing is also a whole new world, a whole new expertise to develop and explore. So maybe you could share a little bit about that journey for yourself. So that journey kind of into your world now and where your energy is focusing and maybe how different it is to say 10 years ago. Well, it's funny because uh, when I first wrote this book, my marketer and my publisher, she's like, well, have you started thinking about your next one? I'm like, no, <laughs> my goal is not to be an author. You know, my goal is, that's not my goal. My goal is really, I feel like I've found a gold mine. My, my goal is to tell the world about this. And that's why I feel like, you know, the more, it's just really telling them that, okay, we have this information from 60 people. It's me, and who else would do something like this and put it together? And that's my goal. And so, so that part of it has been, reassuring that I don't, 
I'm not here to make money. I'm here to kind of sell the idea of the book and how people be influenced by the book. I think the marketing part, yes, you're right. It's something we don't learn, but we don't learn in medical school either. How to, um, any of this, any, any financial part, we don't learn. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. And there's a lot of people, a lot of my clients, a lot of people listening have probably taken their own career and their own turns in their career from that sort of traditional medical model and maybe started their own businesses. So it, it is about learning those new skills, but it's also, I believe it's also about kind of letting yourself be creative, letting yourself follow some of those ideas. So at some point you must have come up with this idea and given yourself that permission to follow it. I think after having published so much and having realized, wait, this is hard work. Publishing is not easy. And and it takes a lot of being meticulous and thinking you it. it's just, you know, planning a project. It's just a lot of work. And after doing that, I think and then my health to share it, I was like, Well, there I'm not gonna do this again. You know, I I finished the projects I was doing, but then I was like, you know what? This is a sign that I have some I have to do something else. And that's when yes, I was more creative in thinking about the project. But did I know? Like it's funny because I was looking at some of my notes from before. I had no idea how to approach or I knew what, how to do a study, but I didn't know what wisdom, what research was about with wisdom. So it was fascinating. And it's amazing because it's led you to this point, which is, which is brilliant. You know, you've got an amazing output that you can share. You're clearly very passionate about it. And you're able to really inspire people to think about what their life looks like, how to create that wisdom, how to create more of a meaningful life. Well, it's funny because I thought about this as well. I'm like, well, what does it mean to be wise? And what is wisdom? You know, and I'm like, well, it's not a sexy term. No one really cares about these days. I mean, they hear about social media, this and that, but not wisdom. I'm like, well, it means having a meaningful life. Like you said, it's having a fulfilled life. It's having a, a life where you're content. And and that's a person who is what? Someone who lives a life with that sense. Do I feel like, like when I look at some people, I'm like, no, they're running in the treadmill or they're, you know, they're, it's not, they're not living that, they're not mindful about it. So, yeah. So what does your meaningful life look like for you? How do you bring that level of consciousness and mindfulness into your life now? Well, I, you know, I didn't explain to you. I know we talked before, but I didn't really tell you that I still can't really walk. I can't walk and I, and I'm limited to doing everything on the computer. And, and so the meaningful life I had, so I can't walk. So I, I'm stuck I, in my home office all day. And it's being, having a meaningful life for me is being really positive about everything. So if I have to, which I, you know, I often not now, cause I don't leave the house, but if I leave the house, and and I have to use a wheelchair. Then I tell my kids, they're so like, oh, I'm so sad. Other kids have their mom or whatever. Take them to this and that. And you can't do any of that. Instead, you use this chair. I, re I go, but well, we have a chair that moves. That's great. It's a chair that moves. How great is that? So I think how I have a mean, or I tell my kids all the time, they're like, wait, so you were home all day? <laughs> I go, yes. They go, I go, but I was on podcasts or I was on this. I great, but I get to be with you. <laughs> They're like, if I wasn't at home all day, I would not be with you. So I think it's just a matter of a perspective of, I mean, what the third element was positivity and I think it's that's how I have the meaningful life is I incorporate that positivity into everything that because if not then what you can't do anything or you, you there's nothing that will make you as content as being positive about it I love what you just said there's nothing that will make you more content than being positive about it 
Yeah, well, and saying what is funny, because one of the, I talk about him in my book, in my positivity chapter, his, who was a minister, and he was like, gratitude gets you to the other side of whatever problem you're dealing with, right? I thought about him, like, the same idea, being grateful is the same idea, is looking at the smallest things, and whether you want to or not, whether you're happy about it or not, you just have to. You have no choice. And and I remember, like, so I, I tried different things to see if this will help me, that will help me. So I tried this laser last month, and it ended up making me feel worse, right? And so I was I was telling my husband, I'm like, well, at least I have arms that work. I have, you know, I my brain works. I can still move my legs. I'm not bed bound. I'm like, I feel I, it was all gratitude. It was all the smallest things which that I could think of that were positive. Look, could someone else be like, oh, I can't move that up? Yeah, but that's not going to do anything for you. So, so that it was all the gratitude. So both gratitude and positivity. Thank you for sharing your story about your health and where you are now how do you think your own experience your lived experience of your health changing has made you look more broadly at health in general to start looking at sort of health holistically i think it made me think that look i think an md has is limited and and it's the part of the process of getting better or healing but it's not the solution and i think what it has done is it's made me think that wait there's so much more uh, more ways of looking at a person healing and there are so many there are different ways and it's not it's not medicine nessa it's not western medicine or it's just not so I feel like what, what look, in many ways, no, many, it has been a gift to be immobile like this and have health problems. It's made me really think, first of all, let me write the book. Second of all, it let me really explore so much more that I would never have explored before. Just thinking about your experience of exploration and allowing yourself to find that gratitude even when times are challenging yes one of the things i think it is in the positivity chapter that you share is that sort of mantra of you know bringing something in like an affirmation something that you can use to remind yourself to give that gratitude or remind yourself to be positive well, it's something that yeah. i love to do but is it something that you also have found helpful in terms of reminding yourself? I don't know if I, I mean, I kind of made it more of something I do because I feel like, you know, look, my life could be mundane, but this gives me that kind of, that positivity, this kind of changes it. And so I do wake up in the mornings and I, I I do the, what I mentioned in the chapter, I do the whole V. I wake up and, you know, I do the V and I thank whoever, or, you know, I thank the spiritual world for being, for another day. And I, and I don't do what I recommend. I did do before, but I don't, but I, I feel like everyone needs a reminder to be grateful. So I like the idea of having an alarm or something doing something but outside of that I think I just I don't I don't do as much right now because I'm so busy but yes I feel like it's an important part of your life well, having a visualization is of you having overcome whatever that may be whatever you know challenge you're experiencing yeah visualization is something I love I love to do to also I think it's like to also feel at the same time, what you would feel like if you were in what you are yes. visualizing, you know, really your that body, connection. Right. right. Your body just not the difference. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for, for anyone, I think it's a good way to remind them that it will, first of all, it will change whatever situation you're in. 
and and to feel it it's a good one yeah your body does not know the difference yeah that's fascinating isn't it like i know like it 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 takes you back to the, the things you learn in med school right but it's like realizing that actually the processes that you are thinking about in your body actually allow your physiology to to catch up you know so it's like when we feel anxious we're thinking about something that hasn't happened our body doesn't know that that thing hasn't happened necessarily or when you're replaying something from the past so using the same types of approaches but putting it into a positive shift then it right. just makes so it makes so much sense doesn't it it's like you it said does. some of these things are quite simple when we think about them but they're often hard to do <laughs> i think i think that was the goal of the book that everything can be very simple you can modify everything to be very simple and incorporate it into your life when you look at your life now and the book that you've created and the work that you're doing to share your findings and these themes with people how fulfilled do you feel with your career it's funny cuz i first of all i would have never imagined i mean don't they say you know you make plans and god laughs cuz i would have never imagined i would have done this but i love it and i love and and now it's the goal is just telling people about it it just and that part is not easy but if there's anything i like to do is kind of of a cover challenge and and it if it's hard hard means it's doable so so it's fine i just, i love doing it so it's i feel very i feel like i'm in the right place at the right time wonderful it's so amazing to hear you say that It's a place I think a lot of people want to get to, and sometimes they allow those challenges to hold them back rather than stepping into those challenges. What What would you tell people who are in that place who might be coming up against a challenge and they're fearful about taking a, a step towards something? You know, I always say this: everyone live in faith, not in fear, and in everything you do, just have faith that it'll work out and that. that they'll be okay and and they're like yeah but but this is the I'm like no don't worry about anything first of all we know the most your worries don't turn out to be anything the worries about are about things that are not going to amount to anything and secondly you have to live in faith that's just you have no other option and and in many ways i feel like that's just kind of the way you want to live your life It's the love of faith. This is so beautiful. Thank you. So let's think back about. So you, we've mentioned positivity. You mentioned the resilience. We mentioned a lot about kindness and spirituality. What are the other things that you would love to share in terms of some of those key themes? Well, let me tell you the eight elements in order, meaning the the one most common. And the reason I say most common is amazing to me how. the majority of the people i talked to had overcome some obstacle and while whatever it was it overcome something big and bad and and in our world in my anyone you think oh how or but it definitely taught them something it made them wiser and you know the whole phrase of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is true it really did and so and the order is resilience positivity, spirituality, humility, tolerance, creativity and curiosity. And I feel like, you know, first of all, I feel like curiosity is the foundation of everything. Being curious about everything and being creative and curious is something we grew up with. We have as kids and we we lose it over time because we're so bogged down but kids have it they're creative and they're curious they're constantly asking why 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 right humility i don't really like that i give humility it doesn't make you feel big to make someone else feel small and i think the idea is just think twice whenever you're about to say something and realize humility is a way to be to connect with someone else 
and no one, and no one knows more, no one has, I mean, yeah, there are some people who have a lot of money, more money than others, but whatever, that will change. But no one is better than someone else. And, and that's the idea of humility. Something you mentioned there was connection. And actually, I think that comes out in some of the other themes, doesn't it? How some of those other themes actually also strengthen connection. Was that something you saw across all of them? I feel like connection is kind of something that kind of is, is, is important to all of them, I guess. But it's also, it goes back to the idea of the themes and the elements. I feel like they're kind of related. They're all like, like it's, it's, you know, to be resilient, you need to be positive, to be, to connect, you should be kind and tolerant and humble, to approach, it just, everything connects. And so, so I feel like it's just, I, th- I feel like it makes you more, it li- lets you live a more meaningful life and the connection is a big part of it. So yeah. in, in my spirituality chapter, I talk about how, you know, people have that gut feeling. Let's say you don't have any spirituality in you, but you have a gut feeling. There's no explanation for that, you know? And so that alone is is your sense of spirituality, whether you want to know, you want to say it or not, it is there. So, because the, there's some people like, oh, no, I'm not very spiritual. But I think it's a way, it's a good way to dip into it. Yeah. It's so clear when you talk about your book that you not only found something that really gave you a sense of intrigue, that curiosity, you explored it and produced this amazing output, which you're passionate about, but you've implemented pieces of it and and made it super, super easy for other people to do the same. So it's it's an incredible, it's an incredible thing to listen to when you're sharing it because you, you can really feel that passion in what you're sharing with the world and what you're offering. Thank you. And I feel like, you know, it's because after I talk to these people, I'm like, wow, you really have so much to share. And, and what was interesting is, as I said, most overcame some huge bad obstacle and yet they were so at peace and they were so happy and they were so content and it was, and they were so first, and they were so honored to be in the project, right? They were so honored, and they were happy and willing, and they, it just they're they're very interesting people. They're fascinating. Yeah. What would you share with anyone who's listening who might be at a point where they need something to support them through a transition, to support them through something like a big obstacle in their life? I would say approach it with faith, not fear. Know that it is happening for you. As much as you want to think that, why me? You you can think, why not? You can think to yourself, I'll overcome this. I can do it. I'm strong. And I would say, you know, it'll go away. And it's funny because when I had my first child, I vividly remember that it was so hard and so difficult to be there, stuck to the kid when I'm so used to running around all the time. It was just hard for me. And and I remember thinking to myself, well, life goes on. Life goes on for everyone, and it does. And so I think the same for someone who is encountering an obstacle, it will be okay. And I also say, think about how Things will be in five years and in 10 years. Will that matter? Will that obstacle be a big deal? And second of all, yes, you are a warrior. You're not a victim. You're there to overcome it. And you're there to to learn from it too. And so, and so it's not going to be fun. No one said it's fun. But I mean, just, but you can do it. You're strong. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you. So I could carry on talking to you. I, I want to I wanna keep talking to you as I'm dipping into the book. I'm going to be coming back and saying, Laura, I've read this chapter now. But um, the main reason for this podcast is really to encourage people to be inspired by other people's stories and to feel that they can be their most authentic self at any point in their life. Please tell us 
where people can find it, where they can buy it, when they can read more about you and everything that you are sharing? Well, for the first thing, the book is sold on Amazon and it's called Common Wisdom. And the reason I called it Common Wisdom is not only because there are the elements or themes that are common between them, it was also common people. And I feel like that's really important. They were not celebrities. They're not famous people. They're not someone who's done like something unusual. It was their common people. So common wisdom on Amazon. And and my website will tell you more about the book, me, everything, and that's lauracobine.com. And, and so those two will be very helpful. Wonderful. And we'll make sure we put those in the show notes. And you also, for anyone who's interested on Laura's website, she also has a blog there, which you have lots of writing about different aspects as well, which are related to the book. So also a really nice way to explore some of those themes. Yes. My closing question for you is where and with who would you have your most authentic cup of tea? You know, I thought about that. I think it would be with, you know, it's funny because my husband often calls, says, my kid, look, it's a big compliment to be like Albert Einstein. I would love to have tea with him. He said, you're like him, you don't care about him. I'm like, he's like, but wait, you do care. And, and I'm like, look, I get it. He didn't care about it. But he looked, he had this whole thing of there. But it's, the more I look into the things he said, and I think I quote him a few times in the book. And he definitely was very wise. And he was very humble, despite being the person who, who created so much in, in physics in the world. Despite all that, he was so well, he was just so, he, was, he seemed like a great person. So I would have loved to meet him. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so for you being here. Thank you for listening to the Authentic Tea Podcast. If you have enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, or share with a friend who might enjoy listening too. Join me again soon for another episode and more mindful chat.